do. Okay, well, we're going to continue looking um, at transcription, transcription before we move on. Uh, we're going to give a couple examples, just a few representative examples of some actual cases with transcription and transcription factors and things like that, just to kind of reinforce some of the basic principles we came up with uh, that we came up with before. So I'm going to give a few examples of how this time thing works and what some of the and some of the key points that these illustrate. So first thing we're going to look at is basically the proteins that make muscle muscle, that are responsible for the differentiation of cells in the muscle cells. Now you look at skeletal muscle cells are highly specialized cells. You see these tubes. They're sometimes called muscle fibers. And these tubes have multiple nuclei in them. So a muscle fiber in skeletal muscle looks like this. It's a long tube. It's a few tens of micrometers in diameter. It can be uh, you know, several tens or more micrometers in uh, length. And then you see multiple nuclei in here. Okay. So muscle fibers have multiple nuclei because they're actually derived from multiple individual cells. Now the other thing you see if you look at it, they often call it striated or striped muscle. You see this side of striping pattern, like zebra stripes that go the whole length of it. And that pattern represents the machinery of muscle, what we call a sarcomere. Here's an example of a sarcomere. This is the actual contractile machinery. You get this by the in space when you take uh, an anatomy or physiology play. Okay, you have these two lines here, and they're made of cytoskeletal proteins, and then you have what's known as the thin filaments. And these thin filaments are made of the protein actin. That's a common cytoskeletal protein, and Oh, that was your phone. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So we have these thin filaments which are made of actin, major cytoskeletal protein, and in between them are these thick filaments. They're called thick filaments, and they're made of bundles of a special type of myosin. And then these lines here hold the assembly together. Okay. Now, muscle control. Yes. Are those connected? Or they no, no, they're actually they're like interdigitate, kind of like this, but they don't actually come in contact. Now what happens is these, these thick filaments of myosin, they burn ATP. Myosin is what we call a motor protein, means it generates movement when you do ATP hydrolysis. And what happens is it kind of tries to pull these filaments, these thin filaments together. So what happens is you get something more like this. And here, let's put these thick filaments in here. Right, connecting between them. So you notice that whole sarcomere shortens in length by about 30 or 40 percent. Okay, that's the basic machinery of muscle. The point is, in terms of development, is muscle cells are extremely specialized. That particular myosin that goes in skeletal muscle is a variant of what's called myosin 2, and that's uniquely expressed in muscle cells. The genes for that particular version of myosin are all over the place, but it's produced in huge quantities in muscle cells. Likewise, the actin version you find in muscle cells is a specialized version of actin that's expressed in high quantities in muscle cells, but not in other cell types. Wow, it's not dressed up. It's <laughs> okay. Okay, so, and the sheer amount of these cytoskeletal proteins we find in muscle cells is far more than what you find in ordinary cells. So it's telling you, muscle cells, to make muscle, and then you have various kinds of receptors, and neurotransmitter, or cytocholine receptor, all kinds of different specialized stuff in these cells. So it's telling you that muscle cells, to make a muscle cell, you have to specifically express a number of genes that are not expressed in other cells. And that gene expression is literally what makes muscle muscle. So the question is, how do you do that? Okay, well, <laughs> all right. <clears throat> well, the way to 
actually make strong muscles is with a family of closely related transcription factors, and that's the myoD protein. transcription factor for the whole assembly to bind to the appropriate enhancers. And that's where we're going to start seeing this type of cool thing here. Myo-D expression is going to turn a precursor cell into a muscle cell. So let's kind of see what goes on. First of all, we have to see how muscle cells develop. In early embryonic life, you have these individual cells that are called myoblasts. They're kind of spindle-shaped cells like so. Okay, these are the precursors of muscle cells. Now, at a certain point in development, these myoblasts start kind of having a town meeting, and they start coming really close and sticking together side to side and end to end. So that's sort of an aggregation. So now we have a whole bunch of these myoblasts assembling together for a big town meeting here. And each one, of course, with the nucleus. And then the cells literally all fuse together. Their membranes, the membranes separating one cell from the next, are broken down, and then you end up with a multinucleated tube type structure that's called a myotube. Okay, now once the mild tube forms, at this point still we are not getting expression of muscle-specific genes. Not yet. But shortly after the mild tubes are formed, then you get all these muscle-specific genes. You start seeing these so-called sarcomeres forming. That's the machinery of muscle. And now you've got these highly contractile muscle fibers. So what we're seeing here is you get this aggregation and fusion taking place, and only after that do you actually see the expression of all these muscle-specific genes. So what happens? How do we deal with this? How does this process happen, especially expression of muscle-specific genes? Okay, well, what's going to happen, the key to this is the regulation of the mild D transcription factors. And that's the point we're going to make here. The mild D proteins, when they are active, what they do is they heavily express certain muscle-specific genes. They activate their transcription big time. There's a specific enhancer that binds the myoD proteins that's found in front of the muscle-specific genes and not in others. But this is a regulated protein. It's a regulated transcription factor. Can yes. you repeat what you said? They heavily express what? Okay. They heavily express the muscle-specific genes, like the muscle myosin that makes the thin filaments and the muscle version of actin and all the stuff that makes those lines that hold the whole assembly together. Okay, so myo D is actually a key. So let's see how this works, because we see that myo D expresses so many different specific genes that can turn these myotubes, which aren't showing any muscle proteins yet, into full-blown muscle fibers. That's what makes muscle. In fact, cells, mesodermal cells that would ordinarily come, become fibroblasts, some genetic engineering tricks, you take those generic mesodermal cells, express myoD at high levels in those, and lo and behold, you know what happens? You can turn it into a muscle cell. Ordinarily, it would become a different type of cell, fibroblast, one that produces cartilage and all that type of material. But then you can turn into a muscle cell. Myo-D is the key. So let's see how this works. Now let's take a look at the situation with myoblasts. 
These are not expressing Okay, now I'm saying no muscle genes. Uh, the genes are there. The genes are not being expressed. Okay, let's see what happens. Now, we've got a mild D enhancer. We'll put E, and then some muscle genes. Let's just call it muscle. We have muscle beach, muscle souls, not muscle genes. Okay, now, all right. <coughs> And then the actual gene for myodes itself and cells are located a distance away. Okay. Now what's going to happen? Myoblast, and here's we'll put an enhancer to out here. Okay, myoblasts are actively divided. Okay, so they're actively dividing cells. Now, what initiates the cell cycle, in other words, what causes a cell to go into mitosis, what causes the cell to replicate their DNA in what we call the S phase of interphase, and these other kinds of things, a series of kinase enzymes called the cyclin-dependent kinases, or CDKs. In cell biology, we describe one of them that initiates mitosis. But there are other CDKs. Now, cyclin, by the way, cyclin is a protein that binds to the CDK and is absolutely necessary, but not always sufficient to activate the kinase. Depends on this particular CDK. Okay, so the CDK and cyclin combinations are going to initiate different parts of the cell cycle. Like a couple of them are involved in turning you off DNA replication, a couple, uh, one of them is involved in actually initiating mitosis. For those who remember, I used that as that CDK1 as an example of uh, regulation of kinases in initiating cell division. Okay, well, one of them that's involved in cell cycle is simply called CDK4. It turns out, in actively dividing cells, of course, you're going to have to have a lot of CDK4 around because these cells are actively dividing. You need that. I think it's involved in the S phase of the cell cycle, DNA replication. Well, it turns out that CDK4 has not a more than, wears more than one half. It not only is a kinase that phosphorylates proteins that like activate DNA replication and stuff, but it can also regulate gene expression. It can bind to certain enhancers and affect, their trans as, and affect transcription. And it just so happens that if you have CDK4 around, it will bind to an enhancer in front of the myo D gene and act as a strong inhibitor. So the mild D gene in actively dividing cells is inhibited by one of the CDKs that are involved in causing cells to go through the cell cycle. So we not only have this protein as a kinase that regulates the cell cycle, it's also a transcription factor as well. In this case, we inhibit production of activation of the mild D gene, and therefore you don't have the mild D protein around. Now, let's suppose, and accidents do happen, let's suppose that a little bit of myo-D actually gets produced. As we'll see later, accidents happen. Sometimes genes you don't want to transcribe do get transcribed, and then you have to kind of cover up your mistakes, like all those guys on Wall Street. <laughs> all right. <laughs> you have to try to cover, up, cover your path, and whoops, we screwed up here. Okay, so let's suppose we do get a little mild D being produced. You sometimes, that sometimes happens. Well, of course, mild D, you don't want this guy around transcribing genes that you're not supposed to transcribe yet. So what we're going to do is, let's suppose we have mild D around. Okay, here's a couple of mild Ds. Okay. Remember, these have to bind to another helix loop helix protein to make the full functional complex. In this case, it binds to something called ID. I don't know what that stands for, by the way. So now they have this complex here. 
This binds to the muscle protein enhancer. I'll just say M from ID, and here's ID right here. Lo and behold, that complex is a powerful repressor of transcription. So in a sense, to prevent premature transcription of the muscle genes, what we're going to do here is first, we don't produce the myo D. We're preventing it from being trans, its gene from being transcribed. And anything that accidentally gets made to begin with binds to another protein. That complex it binds the enhancers, but it inhibits transcription. So we got two ways of preventing transcription. One, you don't have the myo D around. And two, if you do have a little bit, it complexes with something that inhibits transcription. So, in myoblast, you don't get the muscle genes transcribed. Okay, now, let's go to the next step, the myotubes. Now, we said shortly after myotubes form, we start seeing transcription in the muscle genes. Myotubes, once they're made, they do not divide anymore. Okay? If they're not, yes, 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 yes. Right, there were the two myodines, was, was the ID? Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Because the myodines, these helix loop helix proteins, they have to act as a dimer, and then they have to bind to some other helix loop helix protein to get the full assembly, the full complex. Okay. So it's two plus one. Look. What is that about myotubes? Oh, no division. Okay. So myotubes don't divide anymore. They're done. If they don't divide, they don't need CDK4. Why have it if you're never going to divide again for the rest of your life? So we don't get CDK4 anymore. Instead, what's going to happen is other transcription factors bind to this enhancer. What STF specific transcription factor bind to this enhancer, and the myo D protein gets transcribed in large amounts. So now we have lots of the myo D protein. Meanwhile, meanwhile, as the myoblasts were starting to join together and turn into the myotubes, they start shutting off transcription of the ID protein. <coughs> so we'll put And instead, they activate transcription of another transcription factor. It's called E47. And lo and behold, E47 binds to myoD. And then the complex binds to the enhancer. And lo and behold, that combination is an extremely powerful activator of transcription. So now these muscle genes get transcribed at breakneck rates. And now we have lots of muscle proteins. And they all assemble together to make the sarcomeres and all that kind of stuff. And lo and behold, that myotube quickly turns into a muscle fiber. So now it can contract, and now the organism that has that is able to move its muscles around. Really nice thing. Now that often happens, that can happen very early in development in, yes? Does the E47 knock the ID out of the way? Uh, you, you know, I'm not sure. The production, the production of ID drops, that's a good question, the production of ID drops down. So, you know, if you have little of it around, these are weak bindings, the ID will eventually fall off. And chances are there's only a handful around. It'll take a long time for another one to bind. Meanwhile, E47 is getting ramped up. I don't know if E47 can actually displace ID if it's already there or not. So it's just waiting for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, at, at the minimum. And maybe it'll displace it, I really don't know. Uh, here again, um, and actually it illustrates a very important point, and I'm going to get the take home lesson in a little bit. Okay, all right, now we get all these muscle specific proteins being produced. Okay, now the points that this illustrates are twofold. One of them is concentration of various transcription factors counts. What well, we see here with the myo-Ds, 
both the ID protein and the E47 can bind to MyoD and the whole complex binds to the same enhancers. One acts as an inhibitor, the other acts as an activator. So, the relative concentrations of the two are going to make a big difference. If you have a lot of ID and little E47, the genes are going to be repressed. If you have the opposite, a lot of E47, not so much ID, those genes are going to tend to be activated. So here you have the concentrations of the, the relative concentrations of these two transcription factors makes a great deal of difference. And then the second point is the myodes, they all bind to that, the same enhancers. But whether they activate or repress transcription depends on what other transcription finder, transcription factor is bound to that. If you've got E47, you activate it. If you've got ID, you repress the same genes. So that's illustrating another point. The same, the same protein, MyoD, can be a strong activator or a strong repressor depending on what other transcription factor it's bound to. So that kind of gives an idea of the type of complexity and regulation we have here. We can make the same protein activator or repressor of transcription just depending on what else is bound to it. Concentration effects are going to be very significant. If you have more of one or more of it uh, versus the other, you'll get one effect. If you do the opposite, you get a different effect. So let's illustrate two important points here about transcription factors. Okay, that's kind of our little take-home lesson. Now, a little interesting sidelight about the myo-D proteins. Some years ago, in Germany, some biologists and geneticists started taking a look and a very unusual German family, a very unusual German boy. This boy was about 10 years old. He looked perfectly normal, he was perfectly healthy. The one thing is he was exceptionally strong for his size. In fact, he was as strong as an average adult. Even though he's a lot smaller, this guy was Superman. They looked at his family, and many of his family were also extraordinarily strong for their size. And I question it, and otherwise he seemed to be perfectly healthy, it's just they were like, really super strong. So, how do you make Uberman? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. How do you make Superman? Well, they looked, and what they found was an exceptionally high transcription of myo D in that kid, and they verified it with the rest of the family. These guys were cranking out much more myo D in the appropriate cell types than the average person. So they made much denser, much more organized muscle, and the combination made them exceptionally strong for their size. People are looking at that because the possibility could activation, somehow could we find a drug or something that could activate myoD in people with muscle weight disease and build more, rebuild muscle or build stronger muscle. That can be very useful. So there's, now we're nowhere near that yet, but the idea that if you hyper-express myoD, you get lots of muscle, and if you don't have much functioning muscle to begin with, that might re have the possibility of restoring something more like a normal life. That would be really, really good. Okay, so that's one example here. Are you going to say, Erica? Okay. 